very good evening from Fools Rush In on what is a particularly warm evening here in the East Midlands. Uh, Thursday night, Fools, uh, as we are joined by a special guest, former Swindon Town goalkeeper, Ty Bell, for joining us this evening for, for a chat and a trip down memory lane. Um, and uh, as I've been posting about on our socials, uh, Nick and I have got a very special announcement regarding our, uh, our upcoming live show to give you as well. So before uh, we get the opportunity to say hello and good evening to Nick and to Ty, let's roll the titles. Take my hand, take my whole life too, but I can't help falling in love. Uh, hello to everyone in the chat who is uh, who is watching on at Friends of Aiden. Uh, glad to have you back with us. Uh, evening to Rob, um, who has sent in a hello on YouTube. As always, uh, live chat is open on YouTube and on Facebook streams. So if you are uh, if you've got any messages or any questions for myself, Nick, or Ty this evening, you can send them in. Our uh, our tweets are also available, and I will read them out. There'll be no um be no food chat to start tonight's episode because I think we've all got confused enough with coffee chat this afternoon. Um, so uh, there, there's no need for any of that. But uh, something there's always time for is the opportunity to say hello and good evening to Nick. How are you, buddy? Yeah, really good. Really good, Fifey. A uh, bit strange on a Thursday night. It's going to throw me for the uh, weekend now thinking I'm going to be going to football tomorrow. But I have <laughs> I to wait another 24 hours for Saturday. So... Uh, but yeah, different show, um, good guest on, so we're really looking forward to it. Yeah, very much looking forward to it, just seeing what else is going on in the chat. Uh, evening, Royston. I'm well, thank you. Uh, it's going well, as to your other message. Um, Ryan Whelan's handed me my backside scene. I don't think so. It's a, it's a very friendly, cordial discussion, um, and I like to learn, and, and Ryan's a very knowledgeable guy, so... Uh, it's good to understand things from other people's perspectives and not just believe that what I think uh, to be the case is true. Isn't that right, Nick? Yeah, hundred percent, Fifey. It's uh, we 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 know you're the top man anyway, so don't worry about <laughs> anyone else. <laughs> uh, we're getting lots of uh, appreciation for you in the chat, for, particularly from Aiden's mates again, Nick. Uh, but we've also got Rob here saying, "Evening, Sir Nick." Oh, that's good. Of. At a step up, so yeah, thank you for that. It's uh, it's appreciated. So let's uh, hope we can do it justice tonight. Did you want to do the uh, the ad mini bits and the special announcement at the beginning or the end, Nick? Uh, we'll leave. Producer. We'll produce it uh, as, as we go. Yeah, we'll we'll do it a bit later. A bit Perfect. later. Uh, let people be on bated breath. Indeed, as uh, as we get an another evening, Sir Nick, come in. Evening, uh, Royston. It's the perfect time to say hello to tonight's guest. Uh, former Swindon Town goalkeeper uh, Ty Belford joins us. Evening, Ty. How are you? Evening, lads. How are you? Very, very well, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. As we say off camera, very much appreciate your time. Pleasure. No problem at all. Um, Claire is in on Twitter. Says, good evening, gents. Looking forward to hearing from Ty with a thumbs up. So a good, good start there. Um, what I um, what I like to do with whenever we have guests on, particularly the first time, is kind of go right back, if I can, um, and kind of ask, knowing you a, a little bit, because our paths have crossed a fair few times, um, I kind of know the backstory, but for, for anyone who's not as familiar, you come from a very, I think it's fair to say, a very football-obsessed yeah. family, um, so was it always the case that you were going to be into it, and, and were you into football from a very early age? Um, I was, actually, um, very early on. I had no choice, I don't think, because obviously, like you say, because of the footballing background of my family, with my dad being a goalkeeper, obviously my brother, as as many will know, um, my other brother involved in football, and then my dad's side of the family was a striker as well at Port Vale, so um, I don't think I had much choice. So I travelled I travelled everywhere, pretty much everywhere with, with my dad, uh, watching him going around the country, literally one end of the country to the other to watch him. So um, I think it was, it was bedded in me quite early to... Um, you know, be watching football constantly, and I just as soon as I could have a football at my feet, I did so. 
I don't think I had much choice, to be honest. Um, we had a, another former Swindon keeper, Reese Evans, on earlier this season. One of the first questions I asked him was, at what point do you do you decide goalkeeper is the route you want to go? Well, it, was, it was actually quite strange because I never wanted to be a goalkeeper. The, the story behind that is I was always an outfield player. I was always a centre-back. Um, funny enough, bizarre. But I was a centre-back and and I stayed there for, for years. Um, I played for one, my local district team there. Um, I even had trials for Birmingham City as a, as a centre-back. So I was, you know, I went into that position and then fell into the centre midfield position for whatever reason. Don't ask me why. I don't know how. Um, but I ended up falling into that position and I didn't didn't really bother at all think about playing in goal until I, I was in a tournament. I remember the local tournament literally up the road from me within five minutes drive. And um, one of my mates' te- um, dad ran a football side. He said, can you play for us in the tournament? So I said, yeah, I'll play for you. No problem. It's not, not, not an issue. I'm not playing for anybody today because I had the tournament that the tournament Sunday, so I thought oh, I'll play in both here. So I played for him. We went to uh, went to the finals, and the, the lads were like, "Oh, just go and go for the pens." And I was like, oh, "Lads, I don't want to." <laughs> so this. And uh, I saved every penalty and scored the winner. So <laughs> the lads were like, "Hang on a minute, you're all right in goal, and you?" I said, "Not really, no." <laughs> and then they were like, "Just." And then, funny enough, there was a Coventry City scout at the tournament, and he said, "I remember him saying to my dad." Does you want to come down and have a trial for Coventry City? And I was like, no, nah, I'm not interested, Dad. I've got no interest in playing in goal. He was like, son, you, you know, you might be all right. Said, no, <laughs> it just that's that's the way it felt. And I was like, no, I've got no interest in it. Just just leave me. And he was like, okay. And then he and then he come back to me a few weeks later and said, come on, give it a go. And I'm like, oh, whatever, like, I'll just do it to shut him up, you know. Yeah. So I, I did it, and then the things we do for our dads. Uh, yeah, I know, mate. I, and then I thought. What's going on here? So anyway, I went in there and, and so be it. I did well. And they ended up signing me, which was bizarre because I had no, literally no interest in being a goalkeeper whatsoever at that time. Uh, see, the, uh... see dad, dad's no best, don't they? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I always no best. I don't want to tell him that, but yeah. <laughs> That's what I tell my son anyway. <laughs> uh, Nick, I know you'll appreciate this. Rob's, uh, of that very first story of ties, Rob uh, has picked out the key, yeah. the key, uh, the key note. Uh, I'll, I'll just flash it up here. Uh, we actually need a centre back tie. So <laughs> if, if you yeah. fancy, if you fancy coming out of retirement and giving it a go in a different position, then we know a club looking for centre backs. <laughs> we yeah. need two, actually. What about you and your brother? That would be, yeah. oh, be a good crack, wouldn't it? Some combination, I know. Um, I was. Uh, I... I would say I was a bit of a robust centre half, but you know the type of just head it and kick it, just clip That's it. That's exactly what we want. Exactly what we want. Chase my, chase my, uh, chase my, <laughs> my balls over the top. That was it. That'll that do. was my role. Head it, kick it as far away from my goal as possible. Oh, we could love one of those, mate. I tell you. Old school. <laughs> Uh, yes, again, uh, f- for his friends that have infiltrated the chat. Yes, that was Aiden in the background uh, going to get some snacks. Uh, I, I offered him, I said, I literally said to him, I'm about to send the link round to everyone. You've got half an hour. Do you want anything out of the cupboard? No, no, I'll be fine. Wait till I go live. Bang. <laughs> he must know his friends are watching. Um, who were your, like you said, you 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 were an outfield player growing up and, yeah. and that's obviously what you wanted to do. So I'm guessing if I was to ask who your sort of footballing idols were growing up, they might, it might not be the, the people that some oh. might expect in terms of goalkeepers. As normal kids do these days, I just followed every team that won. So, you know, it was a mix of teams. You know, I was a Man United fan for five minutes, then I was someone else, and it was like, I'm, I'm just supporting whoever wins. I never really had interest or watched any. I actually spent a lot of time win, in non-league football rather than yeah, um, rather than watching professional football because of obviously the background of my family and my dad being heavily involved in non-league football. I just spent a lot of time there, and I sort of understood football for what it was yeah. without all the glitz and the glam. Do you know what I mean? And I think mm-hmm. that that helped me really because I understood the, the nitty gritty of it all. And and I love that side of it. You know, players coming from work, going straight to training and it's like, yeah. hang on a minute. You know, let's, let's have a bit of a reality check because, you know, people have the luxury when you're a professional footballer of thinking yeah. that you can just go home after training. Well, it's not like that for a lot of others who are trying to make their way and, and I, and I like that side of it. That's why I like working with the non-league goalkeepers I've got now because I've got lads whose schedules are literally, I can put an example out there. I've got one lad who's, he'll go to work on Monday, trains Monday night with me. 
he'll go to work on a Tuesday, training Tuesday night with his team. Wednesday, the same. Wednesday with me. And then Thursday, Thursday, he actually coaches me on a Friday, plays on a Saturday. Sunday's his recovery day, but he's in the gym in that day. So, wow. literally seven days a week. He, he is practically a full-time footballer, but with a job on top. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and it's that kind of things that, that sometimes people forget that the further down sort of the pyramid you go, that it's that understanding of what goes into it to, to oh, get to, to any sort of level, really. Yeah, and that's what I try and install in, 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 in my keepers that I've got at the moment. I try and say, like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you've got to be the one who's who's fighting every day to to keep chasing and chasing and chasing. It can't be the fact that you 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 know you're resting on what you've got and you know you've got to keep keep putting in that work and that's 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 my mindset behind it i always said that if i wasn't going to be the best talent i'd be the hardest worker in the room so yeah you know and that was what i try and install into the lads that you know if it's gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna fail let it be for the lack of talent that you just weren't quite good enough not for the lack of effort that you couldn't get there yeah. because you didn't work hard enough when, when you talked about being at, at coventry mm -hmm. um we we interviewed one of Towns players from last season, Ken Harris, and he was at Co Coventry and spoke very, very highly of them. They seem to have a really good setup. Was was that the case when you were there? Yeah, it's um, it is a very good setup there. And to be honest, it's probably about twenty five minutes from my house. Um, yeah, well, they've got two. So the academy sets up the Alan Higgs Centre, and right. then the first team is the Sky Blue Lodge, where it's literally just the first team based up there. Um, the Alan Higgs Centre is a very good centre. They've got the indoor dome facility. They've got an outdoor yeah. turf, a main show pitch, if you like, which is the, the main game. So like the 18s and the 23s or whatever it is now. Uh, and then they've got about six to eight pitches on the side of that. Um, but they've always had a very good setup. I remember my goalkeeper coach when I was there was, you, you may remember him from his playing days, Kevin Paul, the old goalkeeper. Yeah. And stuff. So he was my goalkeeper coach then and I got on really well with him. Um, but there, there was a great setup there. Yeah, I've got to say it was a good setup. Yeah. Um, we've both kind of already mentioned uh, about your, your family, and I'm sure particularly your, one of your brothers will be cropping up a, a few times during this chat. Um, it, it seems almost silly to ask, but I, there must have been sort of sibling rivalry and, and you know, yeah. or, or, or almost using each other to, to push each other on. Yeah, I think, well, it's, it's a strange one, really, because Cameron... Cameron moved away just before me, and then I wasn't long after him. And obviously, I went from Coventry to Liverpool at yeah. 14, practically. I, I had to do my last year of school in Liverpool. Um, so, And then Cameron was at Berry at the time, I think, still. So we, were, we weren't that far apart, really, because obviously he was right. only in Greater Manchester and I was over in Liverpool. So, But we didn't really cross paths as, as much, you know, through, my, through them years of like 14 to, say, 17, 18, because... He was doing his thing and I was doing mine. And, I, and and to be honest, I very rarely got a chance to come home. So from 14 upwards, I didn't really spend a lot of time at home because I was always up in Liverpool doing an extra training or, you know, I'd get a call and then I'd be in with the first team or, you know, wherever I was required, really. I just yeah. tried to do as much as I possibly could. And let's talk about Liverpool if we can, because, you know, it's, it's the dream for... You know, every football fan growing up, whether you know, boy, girl, that they want to, they want to be at the the big clubs. Really, what what was your your time like at Liverpool? Because, like you say, you were a very young age when you first got there. Yeah, uh, but you, was... you were there a, a quite what you know, good, good few years. Yeah, so I was there. I went there at fourteen, and I left there at I must. I think I was nineteen when I signed for Swindon. So I was I was there a, a fair while in terms of like you know, a young age to to develop there and I, I worked with some of the best coaches in the world and I got to train with, you know, the likes of Pepper Rainer and people like that. So, it, you know, them types of experiences are invaluable. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. um, just the whole moving away from home and learning to stand on my own two feet from a young age helped me, I think, in my own independence and just, just the way I am in general. I think, you know, I try and keep myself to myself. I'm, I'm quite independent in the way I do things and yeah. I'm methodical, if you like. I just... I just go about my business. Um, but the experience was unbelievable. I think it was a massive pressure because obviously I got bought for decent money from Coventry to Liverpool. That there's certainly an expectation that comes on my shoulders at that age of a 14-year-old being bought. So I think it was like, I'm expected to do this and that straight away. And I thought, yeah. it's you know, so that, that pressure of 
I've got to perform straight away it was was tough, but you know it comes with being at the expectation of such a big club. Um, and to be honest, in my you know, without going over the top, in my early years at the club, I was really doing well and progressing well, and, and was talked about a lot. And obviously, I broke into the England squad quite early, um, and obviously played for England quite early on. So I was on track and, and for where I was supposed to be, probably overachieving really because, well, for what I thought, you know, not yeah. on my own personal views, they were probably thinking they were expecting that. Do you know what I mean? Whereas in my own head, I'm thinking I'm overachieving here. But Well, that, actually, yeah, it's it's interesting that because although everyone dreams of making it, did you, you know, when you're 14, 15, 16 years old, are you thinking to yourself, yeah, I, I, I'm going to end up Liverpool's number one keeper. Or you'd like, I want to be the best I can here and see what my career can do when it comes to the point of actually having the career. Well, I always thought that, you know, whatever happened at Liverpool, whether, listen, you know, <laughs> they get to break into their first team and stay there when, like I said, the likes of at this time was like Pepe Reina in front of me. I had Alexander Doni, who was a Brazilian international Brad Jones at the time, Australian yeah. international. You know, there's a lot of keepers ahead of me. Peter Galatsky, who's now the Hungarian international goalkeeper. So it's like I had a lot of goalkeepers ahead of me at that age. Um, so to break in was always going to be a tough, tough um, task. But at the end of the day, I always thought if I wasn't going to do anything here, it would put me in good stead for what I needed to do next. Um, like I said, it was always going to come with that pressure. But I think yeah. me being grounded at, you know, following my dad around for his non-league period of years. And then it was a culture shock, really, if I'm going to be honest, because, listen, I only come from a, a local little council estate and, you know, I've always learned to work hard for my things and stuff like that because that's just the way I've been brought up. And, you know, I've gone from there to Liverpool. I'm getting meals cooked for me every day. I'm getting chauffeured yeah. around in a Mercedes van. I'm getting, you know, every, literally everything done for me. You know, it's it was it, it felt uncomfortable at the start because I'm thinking, I want to be doing that. I want to be yeah. doing this, but it's being done for me because I, obviously I'm thinking I'm I'm my own independent self. Or I always, like I said, stand on my own two feet. You know, uh, so. that's that's something I was going to ask you when when you were there as a youngster. I mean, we see or hear the like we sign academy players, mm. and they seem to have absolutely everything done for them. and don't have to think mm. for themselves. Whereas going back in the day. Um, you know, young, young players uh, to clean the boots, sweep yeah. the terraces. You know, do all the dirty, dirty work. And that's what I was going to ask. So, sort of, when you were there, what was the sort of setup? By by the sounds of it, um, it was uh, quite cushy on that basis. Yeah, and it was, and that's yeah. that's what I was used to because obviously when I was at Coventry, I had a day release. Now I was obviously very young. I had a day release from school, went to go to Coventry's um, base train with them and I would be cleaning first team players boots now I didn't see that as any I just thought that was a normal thing to do as you're saying Nick that was the yeah. way I was brought up that was the way that I thought that academy players were being grounded by doing the dirty work 100% yeah absolutely and, and that's my mindset behind it and I still yeah. think to this day that should still be the mindset should however be. Great. when we went there it was like at the time obviously Liverpool was sponsored by Adidas. Here you go, here's a new pair of Adidas boots, here's a new Adidas track, <laughs> here's a new this, here's a new that and it was just being thrown at me, obviously goalkeeper, here's some new Adidas clubs and I'm yeah. like, This is a bit strange, you know what I mean? It's a, and it was a culture shock because obviously you've gone from thinking that your mindset's graft, 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 and then it's like everything's given to you, you're not having to work for that anymore that you would have previously. Yeah. And like you say, I disagree with it put on a personal level because I, I totally agree with what you're saying, Nick. I think yeah. ground you as a young lad coming through any system to, you know, you earn that right. You you should be cleaning the first team players' boots. You know, you're wanting to get to where they are. So by right, you, you know, you do the dirty work. Yeah. You mentioned, yeah. Uh, speaking of earning, you mentioned breaking into the England setup. Mm -hmm. And again, if if playing for the, the big clubs in the country is, is what people aspire to, uh, they all want to represent their country, whatever level it's at. So, so, Again, if, if you can, what, what was that like? That was an unbelievable experience. So I did um, a, couple, a few tournaments. My first one was a Montague tournament. Uh, we went away there. So my first game, I think my debut was against Japan. We won 2-1 in that game. Um, I, again, I've got all my, my memorabilia is all the way around. It's in my mom's house, actually, my England caps and stuff. Nice. Um, so she's got all that stuff in her house, funny enough. I don't know why, but... I thought it would have been in my house, but she's uh, <laughs> she's got it all there anyway. And all my shirts and stuff are upstairs and and whatnot. The Pride of one in my house is 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 my Swindon one from 
Nice. Yeah. So that stays that stays in the in the house. Um, but the um, no, listen, the England experience was unbelievable. I always remember one thing that stuck in my mind. Obviously, you know, God rest his soul, he's, he's not with us anymore. But um, Ray Clements, I remember coming off after playing a game against Germany. And, and he said to me, oh, my life, what a performance that was, son. And I thought, Ray Clements, you just told me how good I was today. And I was like, unbelievable. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. And I was like, you know, wow, a goalkeeper of that calibre. And it was yeah, unbelievable. Absolutely. And and like I say, whatever whatever age level that's at, it, it can only, first of all, age your, your development, of course, because you're, you're playing with that next level up again. But to, just to be able to to say that you represent your country is something that, you know, if the pool of people that want to play football is this, and then yeah. the pool that make it is this, the pool that actually get to play for their country is this. Yeah. So, so you, you've achieved something even at that age that, that so few people would ever get to do. Yeah. Listen, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's always something that sticks to me and it's a very proud moment for me. Um, you know, like you said, at any level to represent your country is a, is a massive honor. Um, I never thought in my wildest dreams I would ever, ever represent my country. I never thought I'd ever play for a club like Liverpool, to be honest. You know, when I'm this centre-back, heading, kicking things out of the stand, <laughs> and all, like, out of play and stuff like that. But, you know, <laughs> I worked hard and stayed grounded to get to that point. And, you know, I was a massive, massive honour for me. So, yeah, it was a privilege, really. I um, I recall watching a, an episode of... Um... Swindon's official supporters club just a couple of weeks ago when they were doing one of these on the sofa interviews and and Vic Morgan asked a question that actually made me think do you know what it's a great question and not something I ever think of when you when it comes to signing for Swindon what if anything did you know of Swindon because I've always had this like preconceived mindset um whether it's looking at transfers or playing champ manager or whatever you just mm. assume footballers know all the football teams and, and that's what happens, you know, but, but realistically that's not going to be the case. So it, I've, it did stick with me and I thought next time I get to interview anyone, I'm going to yeah. ask them that question. Well, what, if question. anything, did you know of Swindon? Oh, great question because um, when the interest come up, so after leaving Liverpool, I dotted around a couple of clubs, just looking at a few places. So obviously um, I went first to Swansea because my manager at the time when I left uh, Liverpool was Brendan Rodgers. So okay. he sent me straight to Swansea. Yeah. Uh, I went in there, had a chat with them. You know, they were having chats. This forward, backwards and forwards. I thought, so I'll leave that one. Went to Birmingham City. Um, Local I think, Lee, I think Lee Clark was the um, manager at the time. Um, he liked me. He was interested in me. He said, look, you know, what do you want to do? Um, we At the time, they had Darren Randolph. Might have even been Colin Doyle. He said, you know, we're looking at bringing you in as a third choice, obviously, in the championship. And I was like, oh, no. Nah. I've just left Liverpool as like fourth choice, fifth choice down the line. I'm thinking, do I want to go down that road again? It's just, and then I went over to Warsaw just to train for a little period because I know Neil Cook, the goalie coach, because uh, yep. obviously my brother's goalie coach at Berry. So he said to me, you know, just come in here to get some training done. And then Swindon come up out of nowhere. Um, and funny enough, I spoke straight away to my um, mate, very close friend who I was with at Liverpool, uh, Jamie Stevens, Jamie. who was previously at Swindon. So I said to him straight away, what's the club like and the first thing he said is mate what a club you know great people great setup in terms of you know everything around the club there's great structure i said look you know i'm interested he said the only thing i've got to tell you about is these roundabouts i was like oh what, <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean he said mate there's about five roundabouts on a roundabout i said i can't get my head around this one mate so he showed me the picture of it i said what is that <laughs> and he's he said to me, honestly, it's not as complicated as people think it is. And I went on it. I went, mate, that was a doddle. I don't know what you're <laughs> but yeah, I spoke to Jamie about it. He he reassured me that, you know, it'd be a great move for me. Um, obviously, listen, at the time, Wes was there and I'd done my own background on the club anyway yeah. before I'd signed, as I, as I would expect anybody to do. Um, I know that Wes was an established goalkeeper there, but from what I was hearing through the grapevine, that he was looking to move on. So I was thinking that it was an ideal opportunity for me to step in and and obviously try and you know shadow what he'd done. But you know yeah. I, was, I was trying to fill some big boots. Well, as it well, happens, t- sorry, Fifi, I'm just going to say uh, the roundabout's been in the news <clears throat> in the last week or so because with the release of our new shirt for this season, oh, it's so, got yeah. the uh, roundabouts on it. So uh, 
So yeah. it's very apt that you People brought that up. A little moan up about the sponsor on it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the actual design of the shirt I quite like. And my, listen, my little boy has this. My, both of my two sons have the kit every year, so you know they they love it still. They go down there. Obviously, my wife still got family down there, so the lads still go back as much as they can. I, you know, nice. it's unfortunate for me that I can't get there as much as I would like to because, like I said, I've got my own goalkeeping stuff to do and I'm watching yeah. my own goalkeepers and I like to get down there more often. Um, but they still go down and watch games as and when they can. So my kids are madly in love with the club. Oh, brilliant. Good. That's great to hear. Absolutely great to hear. Um, you mentioned Jamie just then. And as it happens, um, going back many moons now, when I was... Uh, you know, I, I failed in my attempts to break into to media professionally and I decided I wanted to, uh, I still wanted to pursue it as a hobby. Mm -hmm. I uh, I started writing for The Wash Bag at the time and yeah. did a, a number of, of, I was very fortunate to do a number of interviews, one of them with Jamie. Yeah, I think I remember this actually, yeah. And uh, I remember when you agreed to do this, I, I thought to myself, I'm sure I've spoken to someone about Ty when he was at Swindon. Yeah, yeah, and, and I found the extract where I asked Jamie about you. And this is what he said all those years ago. <laughs> uh, he said, Ty and I trained together daily for almost three years at Liverpool. I'm in constant contact with him and to check if Steve Hale's banter's got any better. <laughs> <laughs> Ty's a top keeper. I, sp I spoke to him before he signed and told him what a great club Swindon is. I told him he would be well looked after and the fans would support him throughout sure. and the club suited his style of football. Ty has incredible feet and can kick with either foot with every style you can imagine. Just watch his side, side folly the next time you can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got a great story about Jamie at some point whenever we talk. Please. No, go for so, it. Um, uh, Jamie and me have got a bad sweet tooth. You know, we always said after training, oh, go and get a little sweets or whatever just a pack of sweets and i remember jamie got injured and i thought he's my best he was my best pal at swindon we spent a lot of time together you know after training went into the town center whatever i had a walk around whether we went to cinema or nando's whatever you do as a footballer so um i remember him getting injured so i thought i'm gonna i'm gonna treat him here to a pick mix so i'll go to this i go to i went to the uh it might have been wilkinson's at the time wilco's whatever Anyway, I went to Wilco's and I thought, I'm going to load this pick and mix bag. Massive pick and mix. £20 I spent on this pick and mix. As you can imagine, this bag's absolutely heaving. So, and I've took it into him in the physio room the next day in Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> the physio's gone, what the is that? And I went, uh, this is Jamie's. He went, he can't give him that. He can't be eating that. He's absolutely just fired straight at me. <laughs> so I'll give it him after training. He went, oh, cheers, Ty. Superb, that. And I'm thinking, we're both eating it on the car on the way home, on the way to a body fat scan. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Even the, I remember the other goalkeeper was with us, Danny Ward at the time, and he said to me, lads, we're going to a body fat scan here. I said, yeah, but we need a few extra of these. You know, we were, Me and him were just so obsessed with sweets, eating these sweets at the time. I was like, mate, we can't eat the whole bag of a £20 pick and mix before we go for a body fat scan. <laughs> it was a great banner at the time. So we, we've come to the point where you've now signed for, for Swindon. Um, obviously, and, and Nick, I think you wanted to ask something along the, the same sort of lines. It perhaps doesn't, across the whole time, go the way you, you would have won in terms of you never really got that, that number one spot that you would have really wanted no. uh, but but ultimately how how do you look back on your time really you say the kids obviously still still love the club yeah, and, yeah. and you're obviously the fact that you're willing to come on things like this and, and talk about it you obviously still um regard the club very highly but but i'll always regard the club in a you know it's all like i say it's always got a close place in my heart because i spent such a long time there and regardless of how it went I, on a personal level i look back on it with regret um that I could have done more when I was in the team. But then I always look back and think, was I always up against it? You know, whenever I played, it was on a bad run of form or was it on a, it's like, you know, it's just, I think from my point of view, it was just getting that consistent run of, of games. And it was, it was out of my control really, because every time I would, try and get into a little bit of form, I'd end up coming back out of the team again. Or, you know, like, I remember the one game, for example, I didn't have a great game away at Scunthorpe. 
and he was um, going to take me out of the team. And I went, no, I need to wrong my right. You know, I need to right yeah. my wrong for it. And it's like, at the end of the day, I know I underperformed. And then the next game against Fleetwood, I played well. So I'm thinking, I'm going to stay in the team here. Yeah. And then you find yourself like, oh, you're back out of the team again. It's like, okay. And then I remember going back to it, Lawrence. Lawrence paid that fine because I was the fines guy at the time. He <laughs> paid the fines in pennies. So I'm like, yeah, hey, I've got to carry this rucksack. I said, I understand why you, yeah, you're doing it to, you know, have a dig. I get that. But I'm carrying the rucksack on my back here with all the pennies in it because obviously I'm sorting out all the fines at the time. Then the manager pulls me in the office, tells me that I'm playing away at Doncaster the next day. So I'll play away at Doncaster, looked at my own performance, thought I did okay, you know, made a decent save in the 91st minute, point blank from former striker Danny and Gesson. 2-2 two, two yeah. away at Doncaster. We were doing okay at the time, so I thought it's not a bad result away on a Tuesday night at Doncaster. Oh, I'll play in the next game. Bang, straight back out of the team. And I'm like... I said to him, what have I got to do to, to try and get a little run here? Because every time it seems that I'm I'm trying to get yeah. a run in the team, it's I'm, I'm, I'm and, and the thing is at that time, there was no other games. So I'm just purely reliant on training and literally trying to get listen, I, I don't care what anybody says, you know, I do it on my own right now. I try and replicate as many game realistic scenario situations as I can when I'm training with the lads. But there's nothing like the real thing. The the, the the tempo and stuff is totally different. Decision makings, you know, when to come, when to stay, when to come for a cross, anticipating a through ball, you know, all them types of things you can't get from training. They come in game realistic scenarios on yeah. a pitch, you know. And if you're not playing games outside of the first team environment and there's no under 23 games, reserve games, or whatever you call them these days, then, you know, I'm getting no minutes. It was like one game every four months. And I'm like, it, it's not it doesn't prepare you to be able to step in and then perform. I was, I was going to ask you that is sort of how, obviously it's different <clears throat> for outfield players because, yeah. you know, they can sit on the bench and, and they'll probably get minutes yeah. um, throughout the season with yourself, you know, week after week after week, not getting anything. How, so how do you prepare yourself for that mentally? Because, you know, they say goalkeepers have got to be a bit mad, but you've really got to be strong mentally to do that week in and week out, looking to try and get into the team? Well, it was tough for me because nobody really knows, but I was banging on the door constantly just saying, let me out alone. Just let me go and play. Yeah. Even if it's for a month, let me just go and have a month somewhere. I'm not bothered where it is. Send me the National League, send me league, wherever you want. Just let me have a month out that I'm just playing consistent games and then have a 24-hour recall on me that anything happens, I come straight back. You know, no problems. But again, because there was no other cover, they wouldn't let me go. So... I was just stuck there, literally training all week with knowing that I've got nothing at the end of it. So it doesn't – listen, I'll never lack motivation because at the end of the day, I've got enough respect for my fellow peers and goalkeepers to never put them in a bad light or ruin their yeah. or preparation because that's not my style. I've always been an ultimate professional in that sense that I would never disrupt anybody else's his preparation yeah. to, you know, to try and benefit myself. I'm, I'm, that's not my way. Um, but it, like you say then, it, it's hard to – are to get up for the the game at the end of the week when, you know, you know you're not going to be involved, you know you're not going to play, even though you're doing as much as you can behind the scenes to to try. I remember one one off season. I, I actually recall um, working. I literally didn't have a break. Stayed throughout the whole. Didn't no 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 summer holiday. Nothing. Stayed in literally from the day we finished. The next day I was back in the gym, getting myself in the best condition I could because I was carrying a little bit of weight when I first come into Swindon. I remember that. And then I, I tried to strip down as lean as I could, ready for the summer to start. And I, I started a few preseason games. I think we played Aston Villa, Everton, uh, and I felt good. I felt, and I was being told in the background that I was going to start the season, and that was when the loan come in. So again, I was like, bang, no, he shot me down again. So it was like, it's just a constant here. So that was obviously when I finally said, I need to get out on loan. Yeah, yeah. The the, the other thing on that with um, what I'm interested in with training. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, the outfield players is a, probably a lot of running, a lot on on yeah. fitness for the for non ninety yeah. plus minutes. Yeah. Did you have to do that as well as your specialised goalkeeper training? And if you did, uh, what yeah. was that like? So we did um, as a pre-season thing. I wouldn't say in the season we ever did anything like that. I mean, listen, we had at the time. Obviously, there was Luke Williams and Mike. Uh, Mikey was the backroom staff in terms of fitness coach. Yeah. And Paul Godfrey was the physio. And Paul Godfrey, you know, was in great nick. 
and he always used to say, let's go and do a gym session. So I'd just stay there with him and do a gym session and right. try and use that fitness side of it to do an upper body session or a treadmill run or whatever, just to get that fitness stimulant in if you like. Because like you say, you know, <laughs> I've got to stay on that side of the game because I'm not getting the other parts of it when I'm playing and stuff yeah. like that. So yeah. the goalkeeping aspect of it was obviously always covered because we'd get 45 minutes to an hour, depending on what the team needed us for with the goalie coach. And if we need to go out early, you go out early. Um, but the fitness side of it, I had to either do on my own or, you know, ask one of the fitness coaches or whether that was, like I say, Paul Godfrey most of the time saying, can we go and do a little bit? Right. Um, obviously, uh, and I, I'm going to hopefully get a, a fair few more stories of your time at SM1 out of yeah. you before, uh, before we finish for the evening. But uh, I flashed this comment up earlier and obviously whenever your name gets mentioned uh there there are a couple of moments in particular which which people will talk about and uh, this comment from mike that i flashed up earlier i just woke up glad to see ty hasn't been replaced by cam yet um can, talk, can we just talk through that moment uh if, because yeah. although it's probably not your <laughs> finest moment for as for the family it must have been great well every, uh, we just have a tra tradition in our family that every last game of the season whether it's me, Cam, whoever's playing, the family will go and watch. So, okay. so be it. Cameron is obviously with me at Swindon. All the family come down thinking I'm playing. Cam's on the bench. What a great day for the family. We'll all go out after, you know, have a drink, whatever. So, <laughs> obviously, kick off's <laughs> gone. Lads come through on goal. Again, you know, we, we go back to that, Nick. You know, my game, my match sharpness was probably off at that point yeah. because I'm not at any minutes. I'm coming in cold. In terms of like uh, sharpness, I don't mean cold as in, as in literally cold. I mean, yeah, yeah. sharpness wise, I'm coming in a little bit off of it, probably miss a bit, like you say, a little bit of missed time and stuff like that. And I've just swiped the lad out, clean it. Listen, listen, it's a definite red card. This day and age, you probably get away with a yellow, but <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely swiped him. There was no doubt in that. But in that split second, I've gone down the tunnel, like literally gone crazy in the tunnel. But in the same time, I'm thinking, Hang on a minute, my brother's going on here. <laughs> and it was, a honestly, it was the weirdest feeling I've ever had in my life. It was like a sense of absolutely fuming, gutted, any other words you can think of for me. I'm buzzing for my brother here. <laughs> it's like, this is a bit strange. And then my dad said the same. He said, I was absolutely gutted and I was buzzing at the same time. Because <laughs> it, it seemed, that, that game, it seemed to take an absolute age yeah. to do the changeover. Wow. And um, no, no, in Swindon, my theory was you probably had to give him your boots, your shorts, your top, <laughs> and, and, the your shirt, top yeah. and the shirt because uh, really when you couldn't afford shirt. to have two sets of kit. Yeah. Well, I've always, I've always said that because obviously managers have always got this thing, make sure you've got your pads on, make sure you've got this on, make yeah. sure you've got that. Well, that's not the case for a goalkeeper because nine times out of ten, if a goalkeeper's coming on, he's been sent off or badly injured for whatever yeah. reason. So goalkeepers never nearly normally ready on the bench. So Pam was literally, I think he had a, he must have had a different set of kit on because he got changed. It must have took him 10 minutes to get on the pitch. <laughs> so and then he saved the pen, didn't he? And then he saved the pen, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. It was bizarre. Absolutely <laughs> bizarre. Uh, Mike's fired in with an actual question for you here, Ty. Uh, as TJ, bracket Ty's son, is a striker, uh, who in his family does he think is the best goalie? Is dad one of his uncles or someone else? <laughs> best goalie. Oh, great question. Um, I don't know, actually. That's a very good question. Man, my lad's a striker. He's desperate to go in goal. He is desperate to go in goal. But he, he scores so many goals, I'm, I can't put him in goal. If he ever said he wants to go in goal, I'll just take him in the back garden and fire loads of balls at him. And then after <laughs> that's why you don't yeah. want to go. <laughs> yeah. he's, honestly, he scored 100, 111 goals this year. He's only seven, bless him, but he's he, he's both Crikey. footed. Yeah, he's he's both footed. He's um, yeah, he's good. He's good. One to watch. But yeah, he he enjoys his football. Listen, I'm not. You know, a lot of people say, "Oh, you're going to push him to an academy." I'm not concerned about stuff like that. It's it doesn't it doesn't interest me. I just love the fact that he enjoys playing football with his friends and yeah, you know, and loves and loves the game. He loves. He's obsessed with watching football. He, you know, he watches it all the time. But reverting back to your question, best goalie. Um, I don't know, really. It's hard to say. Obviously, Cameron's played a lot of games in the Football League, um, you know, achieved a lot of games. Like you say earlier, I've represented my country, so oh, I'll leave that one to sit on the fence for <laughs> my old man. 
<laughs> uh, got, got, you mentioned uh, Luke Williams earlier and I got this comment. I used to see Luke Williams most mornings walking to work with coffee in hand. Nice to see him guide Notts County back into the league. Uh, yeah, fantastic achievement for them, of course, uh, this season. So um, red cards aside, mm -hmm. uh, are there any, whether it's on the pitch or perhaps more interestingly off the pitch, are there any overriding memories that when it, it was time to leave swinging, you're like, no, th this one will, this memory will stay? Um, well, obviously, what apart from the result, walking into Wembley and seeing, you know, mine and my brother's shirts next to each other was was yeah. something that sticks to me. Um, you know, I, I had a great time at Swindon in terms of, you know, the personnel that I was with. I, I've got to say, out of all the goalkeepers I spent time with, I had the best connection with Wes. Um, I really, you know, we got on like a house on fire. We actually spent a lot of time outside of football with each other. And I think that helps because, you know, we had that camaraderie with each other and we just literally, you know, it clicked come match day. I, you know, like I said to Nick earlier, I, sh I like to think that I showed him the respect when I played and he did to me. And, you know, and it worked, I, you know, we, we, well, I think that was our best season um, when we were together. And, you know, I think we did, we bounced off each other. He, I pushed him in training, he pushed me. And I worked with some good goalkeeper coaches there as well. Like, you know, I loved Fraser Digby. Um absolute club legend so yeah. i just tapped into his his side of it in terms of his experience and stuff like that and then obviously steve brought the technical side of it and so you know i worked off of both really um so obviously i've been technically coached quite a lot in my career and mm -hmm. through different coaches and everyone has different ways they do things and you just have to adapt um but no i enjoyed it well, obviously, you had uh, Lawrence there as well. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you talked about the the, the pennies <laughs> in the fine. I mean, you know, what what was he like to work alongside on I and off Lawrence. the pitch? Yeah, I liked Lawrence. I liked him as a lad. Um, and I, and you know, listen, there was no doubt you could see that he had had talent as a goalkeeper. It yeah, was just, yeah. It was just the attitude side of it that he couldn't quite grasp. It was you, you don't know what side you're going to get from him whether you're going to get a positive attitude or a negative one out of him. That was the only thing for Lawrence. Um, but I got on well with him. You know, I had no issues with him. You know, um, um, of, both the, uh, of both the ex-teammates you've spoken about there, of course, uh, now both venturing into the Premier League again yeah, with Sheffield, yeah. and Sheffield United and Burnley. So uh, they, they weren't bad keepers yeah. for us, I suppose, but they've certainly gone on to, uh, to I mean, even Wes went to, to Rangers, didn't he? So that's, that's, yeah, not exactly yeah. a, that's not exactly a small club to go and play for, yeah, is it? No, I always knew that Wes was going to be, you know, climb back up the pyramid. That was, like I said, it was it was inevitable, really. He, he had everything in his locker um, to be able to step up his shot stopping ability. He was absolutely phenomenal. Um, he was one of the best at it. And, and, you know, I needed to work on that side of my game and I was probably the better distributor of the ball, and he would always tap into me for that side of it. So it was like we helped each other out in that sense. Yeah. And that's what I mean. It quite, it worked quite well when we were together. I've got a couple of uh, sort of teammate style questions for you, but but before we okay. do, um, we we mentioned at, at the beginning our paths crossing a couple of times, and I, I still remember it uh, as if it was yesterday, a couple of seasons ago now. I'd, I'd heard a rumour, um, I think it was on Twitter, and, and I'd just seen a message to say that Ty Belford's signing for Hinkley. I went, there's no way, there is no way that, that, that my, my, the club I support and my adopted non-league club because of where I live now, there is no way there's a link between these two clubs. And I remember just dropping you a message and said, I've heard this, is it true? And you were like, um, I can't say too much right now, but <laughs> keep an eye out, keep an eye yeah. out in power. And there, there it was announced that, that you'd signed Hinkley. And I've I've kind of been learning as I go because I'm not from around the East Midlands. Um, yeah, yeah. But obviously it, it became clear to me very quickly. Hinkley itself is a, is a club synonymous with your family name. Yes, um, and, and I think you, you've all been involved uh, at I'm some point or another now. So yeah. uh, th does, that, does that for you come with a, a certain pressure? Because... When you when you turn out for a team like Hinkley, you've you've got the whole like I say the, the family name embroidered within the club. Mm. You you know you're a you're a former you know Liverpool trainee that's played football league. You've been to Wembley in, in the pro game. Does that add a certain pressure for you to to stand out when you you drop down to that sort of level? 
I think so. I, I, listen, at that point, um, I was done. I, I'd stepped out of football and I was just done. And my dad said, I need you. And I went, no, I've got no interest. I'm not playing anymore. I, that, that side of it, I just got no interest in it. And then um, he said, just come and play for me. I said, I live in Swindon. <laughs> so obviously he's training at Hinkley. He was at uh, he, the St. John's that were playing out at the time. Yeah, they were. And he said to me, uh, come and play for Hinkley. I went, but it's just logistically not going to work. Like, I live in Swindon. It's a long trek up the Fosway, that, isn't it? You're training on a Wednesday and you're playing on a Saturday. He went, I can give you 50 quid. I went, (laughs) (laughs) okay, I'm in. (laughs) So I signed. Like I said, it was not even about the money. It was just literally, uh, I'll I'll help him, whatever. You know, it was just the thing he said, just, he said, forget the level, you know, Take all, strip it all back, forget it all, go back to your roots, go back to where it all, you know, like I said, you know, I watched my dad on non-league and he said, just come and play for the club. They're great people, which, as you know, it's a family-run fan club. It's They're all like a big knit fam, close-knit family and just, yeah, just come and play and enjoy yourself. There's no pressure on you. Just play. So I thought, he said, just turn up on a Saturday, just play. So I said, right, okay, no problem. So I just started turning up on a Saturday and we started stringing some results together. I was enjoying it. And it took me back to the old school, like Nick was saying, you know, that old school type changing rooms, you know, yeah. all the lads cleaning the boots <clears> in the shower. And I'm thinking, this is, it brought that, that little spark back for me that I thought, this is reality here. This is, this yeah. is the reality of football. Proper and, football. Yeah, it was, mate. And that was Proper exactly football. what it was. I, yeah. was cleaning my, I was cleaning my gloves in the shower, cleaning my boots in the shower. And that was what, I, you know, I see football about. And, you know, I enjoyed it. I loved my time there. I have to say, you know, I did. I did really enjoy my time there, especially under my dad. You know, I love the way he works. I love the way he manages. And I enjoyed that. I had that, that small period, I really did enjoy. And then if, if being managed or coached by your dad is one thing, then, then by your brother is something else. Yeah. Well, I've experienced them both. Um, <laughs> so my, you know, my brother, obviously my dad's a bit more experienced and, and a bit yeah. more old school in the terms of the way he does things. Like I said, having, you know, been through the whole non-league pyramid himself, he's he's, he's quite experienced in that sense. And he's, um, you know, he, he's very well organised and structured in the way he does things. And my brother's more of a, a, a modern type manager, if you like. And, you know, again, he's, he's got the traits of my dad as well. And they're both, gonna, you know, they're both great managers in their own right. Um, obviously, when at the time when I had... Um, when I was with my dad, we had a few more older school, older heads, old school players in there yep. who had been around the block a little bit. Um, so a little bit more nous in the squad. Uh, the, the time I went there, with my brother was quite a young squad, quite naive, really. I was vastly experienced member of that squad. Um, yep. and I think that squad struggled a little bit more in terms of gelling together than the, the experienced one did with the younger heads around it. Um, so, uh, sorry, Pfeiffer, a, a question bit to the side. You touched on it earlier, um, but just before I ask the question, I've just I've just got to say hello to Spider Can because uh, <laughs> hello Spider Can. Hope you well. They won't leave until you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you talked about fines, mm. and I think you said you managed the fines. Yes. Um, we we've we've had say. Kian Harris on and he talked about the fines and the types of things that players got fined for. Oh yeah. Um, you know, what what's the strangest, what's the stupidest, who was the worst? And, then, and you know, give us some insight into the mentality of the modern day footballer. Well, I don't know whether you know, like this day and age is like the they've got this thing called snooze, which is like a little chewing tobacco that people put in their gums. It's like a tiny little tea, it looks like a tea bag. And it's like a tea bag sort of thing. Yeah, it's very strange. Like it's it's like um, a lot of the foreign players do it, but a few players do it. So like, if you left one of them in the shower, there was a fine for that pissing in right. the shower, or stuff like that. And you wouldn't believe how many used to do it. You know, Yas- <laughs> I tell you, it was bad actually. Yasser Kazim was bad for it. <laughs> was bad. Um, any any little things like that, leaving flip flops around and 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 you know not bring, leaving kit on the training pitch and stuff like that, because you know at the end of the day, I used to say to the boys. You know, show show the the kit man a little bit of respect. Turn all your stuff the right way around. Yeah, all your stuff in the in the right you know baskets or wherever they got to go, and make his job easier. Because listen, at the end of the day, like I said, that luxury you have with the footballer coming in, your kit's all laid out nice for you, and everything's done for you. 
did soon moan if you come in one day and went, now where's my kick gone? Yeah, yeah true. Yeah, go get it yourself. I've got a minute. Reality <laughs> check. So, no, there's a, there a few funny points. On a, on a similar note, actually, that, that question that Nick's just asked has, has reminded me of, of something I was watching recently on the overlap that Gary Neville and that do. Um, was there any particularly good pranksters? Um, and, and if so, were there any particularly good pranks? Uh, not really, no. I'd probably say I was oh, one of the worst pranking type things. When we did that Halloween one, I was scaring everybody behind the doors and stuff with <laughs> masks on and all sorts of stuff. Um, we, you know, we had a really good group um, of lads and we just had a good bit of banter between us, really. Nothing nothing too stupid. Um, but no, we had a great group of lads, especially the season we went to Wembley. I think the the tight-knit group of lads we had was superb. On the flip side, was there, was there anyone who didn't quite get the level of banter that most of you were operating at? Uh, no, actually, because that's... <laughs> That season, everyone was just on board. Everyone was just... I think that's why we played so well on the pitch. And, I mean, that was a an extreme way to play football. And I mean extreme. I mean, people... <laughs> well, I, honestly, I, I, went, I remember sitting down with Steve L one, one after one game and he said, you touched the ball 110 times in the game. <laughs> and I thought, oh, hang on a minute. 110 times as a goalkeeper. Obviously, listen, we started out playing from the back. It comes back yeah. to me. You play out somewhere else or wherever the goalkeeper was. And... Nobody had seen that in the football, you know, at that level of football in League One because everyone used to just smash it, you know, snatch it. Yeah. Out the pipe, yeah. And everyone was like, hang on a minute. But then people worked out the way we played and we still played like that. You know, it was, and that was the way that we were drilled just to say it's bravery to play the ball, receive it back. And I want brave players. I'm not bothered about you making mistakes. I want you to play and pass and pass and pass and pass. And that was our, our way, you know suck people in, if the space, playing behind, you know, and shift people around the pitch. And you know what? We had some unbelievable players to do it. You know, if you if you go back to that team and at the time, you've got like Jordan Turnbull, you've got Nathan Thompson, you've got Jack Stevens, Harry Toffolo. What a back four, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> no, but what I mean is, is like, you know, in terms of a goalkeeper to play that, to give that trust to them players and say, there you go. You know, you know that you can trust them with the ball. And you know what they didn't have. You know what he didn't have was that back four though. Ty was that sort of centre back that was just heading and thumping everything clear. Over <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the Stratton Bank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Over the last, I don't know, and really probably ten years, there's been this. Um, there's been this sort of move to what people were were calling the sweeper keeper. Uh, and obviously goalkeepers nowadays have to be good with the ball at feet, have to be able to play, you know, yeah. essentially playing it as a, as a defender as opposed to a goalkeeper. Yeah. Being in the game, are you being, again, you could even go back further, are you being brought up to do that or are you just seeing that starting to happen in the game and developing your own game? Because you were arguably one of the first keepers at Swindon that we saw that were, was able to do that kind of thing. Yeah, because I'd always played quite an advanced role in the way I played because I played at Liverpool. So I think when Swindon obviously asked me to come into the club, I think they targeted me as already being able to step into that role. Yeah. Because I already knew how the, how the way we played. Because obviously at the time we had the link with, um, I think it was Tim Sherwood. Tim Sherwood was there in the background. Yeah, he's, he's very popular at Swindon, is Tim Sherwood. Yeah. So... <laughs> Yeah. Not, but, yeah, yeah. The then, and obviously <laughs> my academy manager at the time when I left Liverpool was Alex Inglethorpe who'd come from uh, Tottenham mm -hmm. so obviously that link was there so he knew the way I could play in terms of my feet so I'd always been quite advanced in my starting positions I'd always been someone who would anticipate rather than react so I would be on the front foot ready for anything coming through to then but I was never a panicker on the ball because like I said I'd already done it at Liverpool for four or yeah. five years so when the ball come through it was my first thought was not clear it like you would think most would and just smash it back up the pitch get as far away as possible it was look for a pass yeah so already in my mindset i'm thinking i've got to be ready here to come and step in and be and be another player as you say there so i'd already had that mindset that I was coming into that the only other thing that you have to think about is that i've gone from under 23s football or reserve team, what it was at the time, Yeah. to now a higher standard in League One. So your starting positions have to adjust accordingly because you get caught out easily if you leave that unattended. 
yeah. and you're in a, you know you're not in a good uh, good position then you've got a problem because the quality you're dealing with you you will get done so i had to adjust obviously but again you know these are things that take time that i always say to the lads i always uh when i'm coaching say to the lads at the start of the preseason take yourself four five games to start getting your, your your sharpness back in terms of your decision making and your anticipating and stuff like that and balls coming into the box should have come should have stay and, and you start gauging that after a few games it don't just come after 90 minutes you know you can't just switch it on and off no absolutely um you, you mentioned it there so let, let's talk a little bit you, you've gone into you know we've got ty bell for goalkeeping now and yeah. and i quite often will, will when I see them pop up on my Twitter feed or whatever, I'll, I'll stop and watch a few of the videos because I always find that kind of thing interesting as, as to yeah. training and stuff. But but how's it all going? Uh, and, you know, where can people find more information about it? So I'm on all the social media platforms, um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I've got about 80 goalkeepers now, probably just over. Um, I'm, do you know what? I just love the fact that I can give a little something back um, I took a lot of goalkeepers from grassroots to academies um, and I still work with academy goalkeepers now. They still come to me on top of their own academy syllabus and programmes that they have there. Um, and, and I love working with the non-league side of things because um, there's some right gems in non-league that people don't see. I've got keepers who have, who have moved up, you know, two or three leagues. One keeper's moved from uh, step six, as you probably know, there five feet, you know, step, step six to step three in one year, yeah. in two years, sorry, um, which is Callum Smith, who's gone to Leamington. And he's, yeah. you know, he's he's a real good goalkeeper. Um, I've got some really good goalkeepers. I've got um, Ollie Taylor, who's very, very good. Um, ex, uh, you probably remember his dad, Mike Taylor, playing. Very, yeah. very good goalkeeper. Um, so, uh, you know, and I've got some great goalkeepers. So I really enjoy that side of it. Um, and it fills the void of not playing anymore. Um, obviously, I've recently, well, December got injured. So, um, had that, I had an operation on my knee. Um, I snapped my ACL, MCL. So, that's obviously a, yeah, long old recovery. Um, so, I, I went and got that done, uh, done the operation. Obviously, the recovery is a 12 month period. So, it just made me make that decision to just knock the, the playing on the head. Yep. Um, like I said, I've never since coming out of the football league really found that spark and love back for it um so i thought why not stimulate my mind with the coaching side of things and which you know i'll get my satisfaction back from now because you know i feel like i'm giving something back and then you know seeing seeing the keepers progress is, is filling that void for me so so how, how does it work with your keepers then are you i don't want to use the word agent but do, do you uh, sort of put, push them through to uh, the leagues in a higher level or recommend players? How does yeah, it work? So obviously, I've got, um, I have got contacts at academies and stuff like that. So um, Leicester, Villa, Coventry and some various other academies that, you know, if they, I feel that the goalkeeper is ready, I'll, I'll, I'll contact them and say, you're interested in a under 14 goalkeeper, under 50, whatever, you know, no, and say, this goalkeeper is probably ready for a trial. Do you want to have a look at him? Yes or no? No problem. Uh, and in terms of obviously my older goalkeepers, again, if you know I can push them higher and and get them a move, I will try and help as much as I can. You know, I'm, I don't want anything back in return. I'm not. I'm not going to benefit from it financially, but in the sense that you know, if they can move on and progress, then you know I've done my job. Yeah. We've actually had a couple of questions of that uh, sort of sent in. First one here. Yeah. Um, what does Ty think of academies and preventing players from playing grassroots football? Um, in terms of academies, I always say this from because I get a lot of parents who say, Do you think I should push them into an academy at a young age? I always say, I, I always think about the 12 years old is when I would start pushing towards the academy because they've then got a couple of years before, if, in the goalkeeper sense, mm -hmm. before they transition into a big goal. And then on the flip side, once they're there, they've then got another couple of years before their scholarship. So it's probably the right age around 12 years to start pushing them in. I think any sooner than that, then, you know, it's it's tough for them because I think it's too much structure too soon. It's it's difficult. It's very difficult. Um, we also had a, another one here, and it's been a big talking point. Uh, we were mentioning uh, off camera just before we started, obviously, Swindon of uh, our, our only bit of business thus far. Um, is to sign a, a young goalkeeper on loan from uh, QPR. And uh, the question, does Ty think that having a number one keeper as a young loanee 
is a good move? Um, yes and no. Um, like obviously last year, you know, Sol did very well. Um, I liked him. I thought he was a great goalkeeper. Um, on the flip side, is is you never know if he's going to be there for the whole season because what the fans won't see is is you never see whether they have a twenty four hour recall in their contracts mm-hmm. or whether there's stipulations, have they got to play every game? So if they're in a bad run of form, will they still play? Yes, they will if there's a financial stipulation in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these types of things you're oblivious to. So at the end of the day, if it was my views, I would always say that, that I would have a permanent goalkeeper if you could. Um, I actually thought the new manager was going to bring in the goalkeeper from Newport with him or, you know... <sighs> The thing is, obviously, you know, what you've got to remember is, is that you've got Steve Milden all there who's got, you know, wealth and knowledge in terms of his goalkeeping and understanding. So you'd be silly not to tap into him and say, what does he think? Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure that he would be having an input in the goalkeeper that's come in. So, you know, if he, he might have been recommended to him or he's had a look at him himself and recommended him to the manager. You, you don't know. But um I would always say I'd, I would prefer a permanent goalkeeper over a loan because, like I said, you don't, you know what you're working with then. You know that that goalkeeper's um, obviously loyal to that fo- to, to that football yeah. club. Yeah, it's a de- a debate we've had over the weeks mm. <clears throat> on the on the podcast. I, I mean, my view is exactly what you've just said. Yeah, we should have a permanent keeper. <clears throat> you can then build two or three seasons, yeah. and 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 you're not starting again. The trouble with a loan keeper is you know he's only there for one season because yeah. if he does well, he's, he's either going to be sold on to another club or yeah. back to his parent club because we've improved him. So yeah, yeah for me, permanent keeper. Not all really that, Nick. You know, at the end of the day. <clears throat> If he's a permanent goalkeeper and he does well, he's an asset to you, isn't he? And yeah, and that's an asset to the football club. If like you just not you hit the nail on the head there. If he's a loan keeper and he does well, like Sol, and he moves up to another level, then you've not gained anything. I know you've gained for that season that you've had him. But yeah, you've not gained financially from it. Whereas if you could sell a goalkeeper and he was on a permanent, at least the club benefits from that. Yeah, that's right. The work and and you know benefit from it. Well, not that uh, not that we're ones for for spreading rumours, but always nice yeah. to see an STFC link. Uh, uh, the, r- the word on the grapevine is that Soul might be joining Richie Wellens this yeah. coming season, uh, re- replacing another former Swindon goalkeeper. So they're, they're, they're all just Swindon players; they just follow each other. And it's fine. <laughs> but yeah, it'd be interesting, interesting to see what he's capable of in League One. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Linking the, the two previous topics in terms of how you coach and, and the style or, or what a modern goalkeeper has to do, do you look at it that first and foremost goalkeeper, so it's like shot stopping reflexes, that sort of thing, or are you working from like say the, the younger keepers and saying you've got to be good with your feet, we need to work on this? So I do different, um, I, I, I will keep a Monday specifically for distribution. So okay. I'll work on a Monday night specifically on distribution and say that is my distribution night. That's not to say that my my other days I won't do distribution on. It's just yeah. that on that particular day, it's solely distribution. So it will be any type of distribution, whether that's an underarm, underarm throw, overarm, little clip into the fullback, pass, short, setback, play out the other way, or whether it's out your hands, literally everything. So I'll cover all the aspects of being able to play out and trying to make the right decisions to give the goalkeeper... You know, paint pictures that when it comes to match day, they can then make the correct decision. Listen, I'm not saying to them that what I do and, and the way I set things is fixed and that's what you have to do. I'm not not asking someone to be a robot. All I'm saying to you is that I'm going to put scenarios in that will help you that come game day, if this scenario does happen, you've then got a decision to make and hopefully it will be the correct one. Um, in terms of obviously my other days, um, they're just structured around... Uh, what that goalkeeper needs. So if, it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm in a one-to-one session, it depends on what that goalkeeper needs. Um, if they need to work on certain aspects of the game. But, uh, you know, the three fundamentals I always say that I want my goalkeepers to have is speed, power and agility. Um, I can work around that. I can work mm-hmm. around anything to do with that. Um, and then I just say they're my fundamentals because I always think that, you know, I can work off that base, that core base. Okay. Um if I can, then, as I said, I've got some uh, sort of teammate style yep. uh, questions. Now, 
I would I would say maybe if we if we could keep it SCFC, but if you have got someone that instantly yeah. springs to mind, maybe that you watched at Liverpool or even even someone non-league who who anyone watched or listened won't know about them, then by all means throw them in. Um so, so the first question is most skillful. Wow. Um yes, sir. Kasim. People won't actually realise how good of a well, you probably do, yeah, how good of a player he actually was. So I'll be honest, I, I think I was in the minority, but I thought he was better than Luongo. I always rated him higher. I, I thought that. That's my own personal views. What he could do with the football was unbelievable. Like I always said to um, Luke Williams used to have this joke and say, I don't think he's got a heartbeat, this guy, because he's just so chilled on the ball all the time. Every time the ball came in, it was like, just so chilled. It was like it was stuck to his foot. He already knew what he was doing with it before he received the ball. And he used to have this, you know, ongoing joke with him that he had about 100 wind mirrors on him because he all he'd do would be checking the shoulder all the time. <laughs> he'd, know the ball, he'd know what he was going to do with it. As soon as he received it, bang. You know, little Croy turns in sharp areas and really close control and just very tidy. Um, obviously, listen, we all know what happened with Yas after, you know, the whole Iraq yeah. situation and stuff like that and the speculation and all that. I think that's what didn't help him because yeah. before that, he was setting the world alight. And he was. that's what ultimately got him his his call ups and stuff like that. But I think if that had been kept on the back burner and not really said and talked about as much, I think he'd have he'd have done really well. And everyone yeah. liked him at Swindon at that point. He just you know, he tarnished his own reputation really in that sense because he was he was doing so well there. Yeah. You know, and no, then like you said, he right. just left a little a little sour taste in people's mouth, you know, at the end because he's he's gone from being absolutely unbelievable and then not quite hitting the heights of where he was at previously. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I know you said there was uh, there was not really a prankster as stuff, but who was the who was the funniest or or the Joker? The Joker, probably Nathan Byrne. Yeah, right. yeah, Bernie. Yeah, Bernie was funny. He used to <laughs> like him a lot. He was a good lad, you know. He, again, I spent a lot of time with him outside of football. Just his cackly laugh and the way he was all the time. He was just always a joker coming in. And, you know, we used to have FIFA tournaments after training and stuff like that. And he was just a great lad. Everybody got on with him. And, you know, and, and you know what? He just went about his business quietly on the pitch. Yeah. People don't really understand that side. As much as he was a joker off the pitch, the way he went about his business on the pitch and was just never caused you a problem. You always knew what you're going to get out of him. I always used to call him Mr. Consistent, really, because you just knew what you were Fantastic getting every week. From him. Yeah, yeah I, I loved him when he was there. You know, oh, fit as a fit as well. uh, and the flip side, uh, angriest or, or the moaner? Oh, angriest. No, a ranger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he did some moaning. I remember <laughs> once. I, I remember one session. Um, this is, is this broadcastable? <laughs> yes. Um, Niall come into training late, as he does. Um, <laughs> coming to training late, and uh, you may remember the striker. This is quite a throwback. Mohamed Al Gabas. Oh, so, wow. The Egyptian uh, lad that we had in. And he come in, and uh, he seen Ranger rock up onto the uh, onto the training pitch. He went, I'm not training. I went, what do you mean? He said, I'm not training. I'll go and run with the physio. I said, what do you mean? He said, I don't train with Ranger. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> oh, my days. He didn't want to train with him because, obviously, just the way he was. But Niall didn't actually cause as many problems as, as what the eye probably met. He's actually a good lad. He's actually, yeah. deep down, he's actually a good... When he's with the lads, he's a good lad. He's, um... I mean, he must he must have been the strangest character because, obviously, there, there was a lot in the press about his off-field antics. Oh, but yeah. on the pitch... On the pitch, he was so good. He, he, he never reacted. He got kicked all over the place. And he never seemed to react against the opposition. That He just no. got on with the job of playing football. And, you know, as a footballer, to me, I loved him. I thought he was brilliant. Well, we and and he's such a different yeah. character between on and off the pitch. I totally agree with you, Nick. You know, he never gave us an issue in terms of no. the way he was on the pitch because he was an asset to us in that sense because, you know, he held the ball up well. Yeah, he was brilliant. Know, brought people into play. He was obviously, you know, lethal in the box in terms of height and presence in both boxes, yeah. by the way. He defended our box as well as he attacked the other yeah. one. Yeah. Um, you know, it was just like you say, his off-field antics that caused him his own problem. I actually remember... Again, nobody would know this, but we actually had a vote in the changing rooms whether we got rid of him or kept him. Because 
Yeah, we actually had to have a vote at one point. I remember uh, Wardy was the captain at the time and he said, right, listen, lads, I've had a meeting with the manager. What do you want to do about Noel Ranger? And it was anonymous. We all just said we want to keep him. As much as he was a problem off the field, he yeah. wasn't on it. or really you know, when, he actually, it. when he actually was at training, he wasn't a problem. He was just getting in there. <laughs> 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 and then not on the flip side, like, you know, he, he would come to the games on a match day and he wouldn't have had anything all night. So he goes into the manager's room and obviously the manager's got his like little sandwiches in there before the game. He's, he's eating the gaffer sandwiches before the game because he's had a meal. So like, things like that and you're thinking, what is going on here? But listen, as, as a lad, you know, I've gone really well with him. I've got to say, I didn't mind him at all. Uh, best trainer. Oh, um, best trainer. Good question. Um, I would say Wardy. At the oh, time, right. we were there. yeah, very good. Do you know what? One of the one of the nicest blokes. Lead I've by ever example. Had. Yeah, and he was. He was a pure leader. He ate the cleanest I've ever seen in my life. He was ripped to shreds. He was just the the yeah, a pure example to the younger lads just of of what a proper pro is like. You know, if I could say any pro that I've worked with, I would yeah. say Wardy's probably up there, one of the most professionals I've been around. Nice. Uh, the quickest. Oh, quickest. Oh, was a, this was a good one, actually. I don't know if you remember um, Brad Smith, the left back. Yes. We had him from Liverpool. Online from Liverpool, absolutely yeah. Absolutely rapid. Uh, it was a toss up between him and Nathan Byrne. Okay. Nice. Both very quick. Um, is Brad Smith. <sighs> I'm probably confusing him with someone else. Did he end up at Bournemouth? Yes, he did. He did, yeah. He ended up at Bournemouth, then I think he went to the MLS, and then I'm not sure if he's in the Australian leagues or something like that now. Okay. Nice. Um, uh, who was who was actually the hard man? Ooh, the hard man. I would say in terms of um, hard man, I'd probably say Nathan Thompson in terms yeah. of... Surprise. The presence of just flying into, but then I think because it's <laughs> flying a, into tackles, yeah. yes, <laughs> because of the sentimental side of it with Swindon, I think he always played that on the edge type of game because of the, you know, the passion and the pride for the badge. He just he couldn't help that side of it. I don't think because it meant that much to him that that was just the way he played. So obviously Swindon fans have a have an impression of him and, and people generally will will mm. remember Nathan very positively but yeah. we all have this um or most of us will have this sort of overriding feeling that that was how he played and and probably yeah. because like you say the Swindon thing when you see him uh documentaries on other clubs and stuff I, I do have to ask did he train like he played surely he was not training 120 miles an hour like he was on the pitch I don't know he um he <laughs> Not so much that because we tried to keep it as, I mean, we <laughs> didn't have a massive, as we yeah, we weren't blessed with a massive squad at that time. I don't think we had the biggest squad in the world. We weren't like, you know, on mass numbers. So we tried to be sensible, but he he, he didn't shy away from a tackle. He, you know, he <laughs> he would still you know fly into tackles in training, but that's just the way he was. That was just yeah. the way he was. He just, you know, he just trained the way he played, and that was just the, that was just nice. And then uh, t two final ones in, in true Soccer AM style, uh, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, best or possibly worst dress sense? Ooh. Worst dressed. Probably Wardy, you know. <laughs> worst. Um, he just used to come in some mad gear. Just like combat shorts and T-shirts and like sandals. And I'm like, it looks like some out of Bear Grylls or something like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking... This is a bit odd. Um, Probably why he was so fit. He'd run up a mountain. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. It's just like, he actually looked like that. And, it, and most of the time, he had a backpack on because he had, um, he had like, all of his lunch and stuff in there because he preps all his own lunch and, like, eats, like, pure ginger. And, he, honestly, he's massive on his diet and stuff like that. You wouldn't believe how unbelievable he was. Oh, brought his own little tubs of olive oil in and everything. He was <laughs> serious on it. People wouldn't yeah. believe how serious he was on his diet. Like, real clean. Um, full respect then, for it though yeah oh yeah full respect I couldn't do it I enjoy the picking up too much and then <laughs> yeah. the, uh, <laughs> the, um, the best dress probably probably Nathan Byrne or Wes Wes had a good dress sense to be fair okay. sticking with my goalie union 
Yeah. Um, and then uh, similarly, uh, best and worst taste in music. Ooh. Best taste, I would probably say, probably Nathan Byrne again, you know. Okay. Yeah. Getting a lot. Yeah. Nathan Byrne's getting a lot of love tonight. Yeah, yes, he had some good tunes on. They're my type of tunes, actually. Um, worst. Um, I'm just waiting for someone random actually. to get named with, like, psychedelic. Yeah, bad music, because even they thought Wes took the, um, took the music. Yeah, so we didn't really hear any bad music. Okay. Um, not really any bad music, to be fair. Nice. Um, Nick, did you have any uh, final questions you wanted to ask Ty? I realise that we've already taken up well over an hour of his of his time this evening. You're all right, lads. Don't worry. No, no, I don't think so, really. I mean, it's just really thanks. It's it's been really interesting, and um, you know, obviously, what you're doing with with young keepers now is is brilliant. And I, you know, I hope you push them through, and uh, they get some success going through. So it's uh, yes, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Thank you, mate. I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and of course, uh, uh, we'll carry on retweeting and posting stuff that, that we see on your socials so they come up on ours as well. And, and we'll share links for anyone who, who might want to get in touch that, you know, because as much as we're Swindon Town, you know, I when I was posting about this, I was I was tagging things like Hinkley and stuff in because I know a lot of people local to heal um, always uh, love hearing from you as well. But honestly, uh, thank you again very much for your time. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed listening to it. And, uh, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll get you on again uh, in the not too distant future. No, thank you both. Really, uh, really appreciate you both having me on here. And like I said, you know it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, hopefully I'll get back down to a Swindon game soon because, like I said, my, my boys and and my uh, my wife absolutely love it down there. So I'll try and get down. And uh, let us let us know next another. time you're going going to a game. We'll, we'll, we'll see beer. if we can get a few of the fools guys to meet up with you all. Yeah, we'll have a beer. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Good. No problem, <laughs> thank you, Ty. Thanks, okay. Lads. Cheers, Ty. Cheers, lads. Um, absolutely brilliant uh, listening to Ty this evening. But we're not done yet, are we? <clears throat> uh, no, no, not quite. We've got uh, uh, a sort of a major announcement to make. We have. Um, so as as regulars to Fools Rushing know, for a little while now, we've been talking about uh, Fools Go Live, uh, 4th of August, the sort of Swindon Town uh, season kickoff party, if you will. Um, I actually think the numbers have increased to 10 out of the 12 regular fools that are now appearing on the night. Um, it's it's a three-hour show. Uh, we've got, um, uh, well, as it says on the picture, we, we're doing the usual uh, fools quiz, which Mike's very kindly putting together for us, which if it's anything like what I've been uh, hearing and reading, it's going to be good fun. There'll be a lot of audience participation. Um, Craig's convinced me to do Defend the Indefensible. Um, before we talk about the, the big announcement for the auction, though, Nick, um, obviously British Heart Foundation is is very close to Fools, um, and in particular yourself. Yeah, I mean, I was really pleased that <clears throat> everybody agreed to support this this charity, um, as people would know, that um, just over a year ago now, I, I had a heart attack. Um, thought I was just going to get a couple of stents in because I didn't seem to be that serious, but ended up having a triple bypass. And, and thankfully, you know, I'm I'm doing well. That's that's all recovered. Um, I'm sure he won't mind me saying Rich Rich's dad had the same. Um, also, my mum had heart issues. And along with my mother-in-law and father-in-law, so yeah, it is you know to, to coin a phrase, it is close to my heart. Yeah. And uh, you know, the more we can raise for it, um, you know, we're we're, we're pushing it, and uh, hopefully, we get a good sum out of it. So uh, yes, yeah, it's a real good cause to uh, be involved with. Um, because of the the venue we've chosen, it is a limited capacity. We have ticketed the event, but as as we keep saying, there is no fixed price for tickets all we ask just get in touch with any member it could be me nick any member of the the regular falls panel we can send you details of our just giving page and whatever donation you're comfortable with because we are <clears> conscious <throat> we are in the midst of a cost of living crisis uh so you know one pound two pound twenty pound fifty pound whatever you're comfortable donating um at just if you're able to do so and then we we will issue you as many of the tickets as you would like and and as such one of the things we've advertised is they're going to be a charity auction on the night. Uh, we've been sharing uh, these sorts of posts around to say that we've 
um, made free of the uh, auction lots available for pre-bids. Um, Nick is receiving uh, email bids from people. We've got a, a signed shirt from last season. We've got a signed shirt from 2009. And a bespoke Fools Rush In 2023-24 calendar, uh, all available to pre-bid on. Um, the, the, the last one, obviously, to help you plan all your Swindon Town home and away days. But Nick, we would like to talk about a donation that, uh, that has been made that is only going to be available on the night. Yeah, that, that's right. And it was um, a good link from Ty talking about... Uh having a sweet tooth and uh um so thinking about chocolate bars and uh something that's inside um a very sought after chocolate bar is a thing called a golden ticket and uh, believe it or not we've got a golden ticket very very kindly given to us by swindon town um i don't think you better see that very clearly no that's all right i'll bring it closer to the screen <clears throat> in a minute yeah, so, uh, you know, we're, we're grateful for the support from the club. So it's, you know, a real fantastic gesture from them. Yeah. But, uh, they've given this golden ticket. That come to the auction on the night, put a bid in for it, and uh, you'll get the joy of uh, being able to see Swindon for all their home games with a fantastic season that we're going to have with our new manager. And we might even get some new players as well. Indeed, I have to say uh, thank you very much to, to Swindon Town Football Club, in particular to Caroline who helped sort it out. This golden ticket, um, the, the winning auction bid, will receive a season ticket uh, to any stand of your choice. Um, again, uh, it's available on the auction night. Um, the winner will be able to redeem the golden ticket at Swindon Town Football Club um, for the value of one season ticket. So hopefully that is enough uh, to whet the appetite of a few people as well. Because, again, that's a, that's a beyond generous donation from Swindon Town Football Club. We, we can't thank them enough for their support with that. And uh, we hope that that alongside, you know, we, we haven't announced all the auction lots yet, Nick, ha uh, yet, have we, Nick? But we have a, we have a lot of, of, of good, good um, products available, Swindon Town related and not so as well. Yeah, we, we, we do. And we've got some um, really high value items in there. So, you know, it's, uh, hopefully they will get some sort of catalogue out in the, in the near future before the event so people can see, see what we've got. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it's, uh, you know, looking for lots of Swindon Town items. Um, some kindly donated by companies, as I've already posted. Uh, I've received a... Uh, a print of uh, Charlie Austin after the Grimsby game from Dan Designs. So, you know, we we appreciate that. And as you've seen, we've got a number of bucket hats um, from Seaside Red. So, and, uh, you know, I've, I I bought myself the black one. Should have waited to the auction, really, shouldn't I? I might have got it as a good deal. Um, <laughs> but he's provided us a, a black one, an England one, and and the green one. So really appreciate the help from... Uh, uh, from that from that score so it's, yeah it's really good people have been really kind to us yeah there, there are a lot of people to thank and there will be a catalogue go out of all the auction lots uh we're just waiting on delivery of the last couple um uh, but but thank you obviously we, we've put a couple of posts out on our social media there are people who are attending the event who have also managed to to uh, offer donations as well so so we're really hopeful the event will be a success and we would love for as many of you as possible to be there. So again, if you would like a ticket to the event, uh, it'll get you, uh, on, you know, you'll get to see the panel, you'll get to take part in the games, the quizzes, the defending and defensible, you'll get to be there for um, all the auction lots that that ne don't all necessarily get made available for pre-bids. Um, just get in contact with any of us via our socials and we can pass you the details and sort out emailing you uh, some tickets for it. That's Friday the 4th of August. Um, yeah. Starts at 8pm. Yeah, just, just ready to get the season season going. Uh, you know, we, we'll be chatting about the game um, on the Saturday, um, get the views on that, and you'll be able to stitch us up with Defend the Indefensible because we all love that game and uh, we're really looking forward to it. <laughs> what, what's not to like a, a quiz by Mike that will be no good at a defending and defence for that everyone gets nervous doing and in yeah. front of a in front of a room full of people who are ready to heckle us. It's going to be a good laugh, isn't it? It will be. It will be a good night. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. It will be a good night. 
We're looking forward to it immensely. Um, that concludes uh, Fools for this evening. Again, we can't thank Ty enough for his time. I, I really enjoyed that, Nick. No, I, I thought good. he was superb. And yeah, I brilliant. Drop in it. I can see that Darren uh, tweeted as soon as he left. Uh, appreciate that, Darren, saying, uh, Fools are shooting fantastic insight from Ty Belford. What a lovely fella. Really enjoyed it. And wish you all the best with your goalkeeping school. Um which he's replied to as well on Twitter saying so thanks, Darren. Much appreciated. Uh, Joe is going to be there. Joe Archer, she can't wait. Um, we're looking forward to seeing Joe and Mark and everyone else who already has tickets to Fools Live. Uh, Nick, thank you very much for your time. As you said, we're doing it on a Thursday. Yeah, it's a um, different Thursday night. So, so I've, uh, they've got to let Friday drag and uh, looking forward to Saturday going, actually going you're to going, the you're game. You're going to Melksham, aren't you? Yeah, I'm going down to Melksham for the game. So, Hopefully we'll see, uh, you know, maybe a few of the people that uh, watch us come and say hello and uh, it'll be, uh, you know, a good day. I want I want Fools Russian tagging in as many selfies with Nick as possible at the Melchior <laughs> Friendly, please. <laughs> yeah, Keep that'd be busy. really good. Yeah, we don't charge for photos, so we're quite happy to <laughs> Plus do he's taken Plus, he's taken a future young fan <laughs> with him for their first time, so it'd be great for him to, to look really famous. Yeah. <laughs> <as well. laughs> That's it. It'll, it'll impress my daughter when he gets back. So it's all good. Um, enjoy the friendly on Saturday, Nick. And oh, while, while I remember, we have another guest coming on on Monday. Uh, former uh, Swindon Town youngster, as he was at the time, uh, and, a, and a youth international. Um, Aaron Oakley is coming on to uh, join Falls on Monday. Um, and uh, he is equipped with a story or two from the PDC era, which everybody enjoys. So looking forward to that on Monday. Um, but that's it for, for the weekend. We're done. You can have a long weekend, Nick, now. Um, oh, oh, we've got Steve here. <laughs> uh, we've got a cop. We've got some uh, recommendations. Take your umbrella, Nick. Yeah. Um, uh, a bit of rain doesn't hurt. We don't go rusty, so it's not a problem. And uh, Stephen, completely understandable, mate. Gutted I missed the event as I'm in Suffolk, only 30 miles from Colchester but not sure my girlfriend will accept me going. Um, I'm sure she will. I'm sure she will. Yeah, just go anyway. <laughs> um, thank you all for, for watching along. Uh, thank you for listening, contributing in the chat. And if you are listening back, thank you very much for your time as well. And uh, one final thank you uh, is to the guys at TSTBL. They... They, they were unaware that we were doing a Thursday episode. We were unaware they were doing a Thursday episode, uh, but they graciously uh, said that they would finish in time so that as many people as possible could listen to Ty. So we appreciate their efforts there. G good to have them back and uh, putting their content out for the new season as well. But from, from uh, us two and everyone behind the scenes at FRI, thank you very much for your time this evening. We will see you again on Monday. Good night. Yeah, good night, folks. Take Take my whole life too But I can't help falling